Part eight of Indian Boyhood by Charles Eastman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Maiden's Feast. There were many peculiar customs among the Indians of an earlier period, some of which tended to strengthen the character of the people and preserve their purity. Perhaps the most unique of these was the annual Feast of the Maidens. The casual observer would scarcely understand the full force and meaning of this ceremony. The last one that I ever witnessed was given at Fort Ellis, Manitoba, about the year 1871. Upon the table land, just back of the old trading post, and fully a thousand feet above the Assiniboine River, surrounded by groves, there was a natural amphitheatre. At one end stood the old fort, where since 1830 the northern tribes had come to replenish their powder horns and lead sacks and to dispose of their pelts. In this spot there was a reunion of all the renegade Sioux on the one hand, and of the Assiniboines and Crees, the Canadian tribes, on the other. They were friendly. The matter was not formally arranged, but it was usual for all the tribes to meet here in the month of July. The Hudson Bay Company always had a good supply of red, blue, green, and white blankets, also cloth of brilliant dye, so that when their summer festival occurred the Indians did not lack gaily colored garments. Paints were bought by them at pleasure, short sleeves were the fashion in their buckskin dresses, and beads and porcupine quills were the principal decorations. When circumstances are favorable, the Indians are the happiest people in the world. There were entertainments every single day, which everybody had the fullest opportunity to see and enjoy. If anything, the poorest profited the most by these occasions because a feature in each case was the giving away of savage wealth to the needy in honor of the event at any public affair involving the pride and honor of a prominent family there must always be a distribution of valuable presents one bright summer morning while we were still at our meal of jerked buffalo meat we heard the herald of the wapiton band upon his calico pony as he rode around our circle white eagle's daughter the maiden red star invites all the maidens of all the tribes to come and partake of her feast it will be in the wapiton camp before the sun reaches the middle of the sky all pure maidens are invited red star also invites the young men to be present to see that no unworthy maiden should join in the feast the herald soon completed the rounds of the different camps, and it was not long before the girls began to gather in great numbers. The fort was fully alive to the interest of these savage entertainments. This particular feast was looked upon as a semi-sacred affair. It would be desecration for any to attend who was not perfectly virtuous. Hence it was regarded as an opportune time for the young men to satisfy themselves as to who were the virtuous maids of the tribe there were apt to be surprises before the end of the day any young man was permitted to challenge any maiden whom he knew to be unworthy but woe to him who could not prove his case it meant little short of death to the man who endeavored to disgrace a woman without cause the youths had a similar feast of their own, in which the eligibles were those who had never spoken to a girl in the way of courtship. It was considered ridiculous to do so, before attaining some honor as a warrior, and the novices prided themselves greatly upon their self-control. From the various camps the girls came, singly or in groups, dressed in bright-colored calicoes, or in heavily fringed and beaded buckskin their smooth cheeks and the central part of their glossy hair was touched with vermilion all brought with them wooden basins to eat from some who came from a considerable distance were mounted upon ponies a few for company or novelty's sake rode double the maiden's circle was formed about a cone-shaped rock which stood upon its base this was painted red beside it two new arrows were lightly stuck into the ground this is a sort of altar to which each maiden comes before taking her assigned place in the circle and lightly touches first the stone and then the arrows by this oath she declares her purity whenever a girl approaches the altar there is a stir among the spectators and sometimes a rude youth would call out 
take care you will overturn the rock or pull out the arrows such a remark makes the girls nervous and especially one who is not sure of her composure immediately behind the maiden's circle is the old woman's or chaperone's circle this second circle is almost as interesting to look at as the inner one the old women watched every movement of their respective charges with the utmost concern having previously instructed them how they should conduct themselves in any event there was never a more gorgeous assembly of the kind than this one the day was perfect the crees displaying their characteristic horsemanship came in groups the assiniboines with their curious pompadour well covered with red paint the various bands of sioux all carefully observed the traditional peculiarities of dress and behavior the attaches of the fort were fully represented at the entertainment and it was not unusual to see a pale-faced maiden take part in the feast the whole population of the region had assembled and the maidens came shyly into the circle the simple ceremonies observed prior to the serving of the food were in progress when among a group of wapiton sioux young men there was a stir of excitement all the maidens glanced nervously toward the scene of the disturbance soon a tall youth emerged from the throng of spectators and advanced toward the circle every one of the chaperones glared at him as if to deter him from his purpose but with a steady step he passed them by and approached the maiden circle at last he stopped behind a pretty assiniboine maiden of good family and said i'm sorry but according to custom you should not be here the girl arose in confusion but she soon recovered her self-control what do you mean she demanded indignantly three times you have come to court me but each time i have refused to listen to you i turned my back upon you twice i was with mashtina she can tell the people that this is true the third time i had gone for water when you intercepted me and begged me to stop and listen i refused because i did not know you my chaperone makatapawi knows that i was gone but a few minutes i never saw you anywhere else the young man was unable to answer this unmistakable statement of facts and it became apparent that he had sought to revenge himself for her repulse whoa whoa carry him out was the order of the chief of the indian police and the audacious youth was hurried away into the nearest ravine to be chastised the young woman who had thus established her good name returned to the circle and the feast was served the maiden's song was sung and four times they danced in a ring around the altar each maid as she departed once more took her oath to remain pure until she should meet her husband end of part eight part nine chapter one of indian boyhood by charles eastman this librivox recording is in the public domain part nine more legends chapter one a legend of devil's lake after the death of smoky day old weyuha was regarded as the greatest storyteller among the wapiton sioux tell me good weyuha a legend of your father's country i said to him one evening for i knew the country which is now known as north dakota and southern manitoba was their ancient hunting ground i was prompted by uncheeda to make this request after the old man had eaten in our lodge many years ago he began as he passed the pipe to uncle we travelled from the otter tail to minnewakan devil's lake at that time the mound was very distinct where chotanka lies buried the people of his immediate band had taken care to preserve it this mound under which lies the great medicine man is upon the summit of minnewakan chante the highest hill in all that region it is shaped like an animal's heart placed on its base with the apex upward the reason why this hill is called minnewakan chante or the heart of the mysterious land i will now tell you 
it has been handed down from generation to generation far beyond the memory of our great-grandparents it was in chotanka's line of descent that these legends were originally kept but when he died the stories became everybody's and then no one believed in them it was told in this way i sat facing him wholly wrapped in the words of the storyteller and now i took a deep breath and settled myself so that i might not disturb him by the slightest movement while he was reciting his tale we were taught this courtesy to our elders but i was impulsive and sometimes forgot a long time ago resumed weyuha the red people were many in number and they inhabited all the land from the coldest place to the region of perpetual summer time it seemed that they were all of one tongue and all were friends all the animals were considered people in those days the buffalo the elk the antelope were tribes of considerable importance the bears were a smaller band but they obeyed the mandates of the great mystery and were his favorites and for this reason they have always known more about the secrets of medicine so they were held in much honor the wolves too were highly regarded at one time but the buffalo elk moose deer and antelope were the ruling people these soon became conceited and considered themselves very important and thought no one could withstand them the buffalo made war upon the smaller tribes and destroyed many so one day the great mystery thought it best to change the people in form and in language he made a great tent and kept it dark for ten days into this tent he invited the different bands and when they came out they were greatly changed and some could not talk at all after that however there is a sign language given to all the animals that no man knows except some medicine men and they are under a heavy penalty if they should tell it the buffalo came out of the darkened tent the clumsiest of all the animals the elk and moose were burdened with their heavy and many branched horns while the antelope and deer were made the most defenceless of animals only that they are fleet of foot the bear and the wolf were made to prey upon all the others man was alone then when the change came the great mystery allowed him to keep his own shape and language he was king over all the animals but they did not obey him from that day man's spirit may live with the beasts before he is born a man he will then know the animal language but he cannot tell it in human speech he always retains his sympathy with them and can converse with them in dreams i must not forget to tell you that the great mystery pitched his tent in this very region some legends say that the Miniwakan Chante was the tent itself, which afterward became earth and stones. Many of the animals were washed and changed in this lake, the Miniwakan, or mysterious water. It is the only inland water we know that is salt. No animal has ever swum in this lake and lived. Tell me, I eagerly asked is it dangerous to man also yes he replied we think so and no indian has ever ventured in that lake to my knowledge that is why the lake is called mysterious he repeated i shall now tell you of chotanka he was the greatest of medicine men he declared that he was a grizzly bear before he was born in human form weyuha seemed to become very earnest when he reached this point in his story listen to chotanka's life as a grizzly bear as a bear he used to say my home was in sight of many wankan chante 
i live with my mother only one winter and i only saw my father when i was a baby then we lived a little way from the chante to the north among scattered oak upon a hillside overlooking the miniwakan when i first remember anything i was playing outside of our home with a buffalo skull that i had found nearby i saw something that looked strange it walked upon two legs and it carried a crooked stick and some red willows with feathers tied to them it threw one of the willows at me and i showed my teeth and retreated within our den just then my father and mother came home with a buffalo calf they threw down the dead calf and ran after the queer thing he had long hair upon a round head his face was round too he ran and climbed up into a small oak tree my father and mother shook him down but not before he had shot some of his red willows into their sides mother was very sick but she dug some roots and ate them and she was well again it was thus that chotanka first taught the use of certain roots for curing wounds and sickness Weyuha added one day he resumed the grizzly's story when i was out hunting with my mother my father had gone away and never came back we found a buffalo cow with her calf in a ravine she advised me to follow her closely and we crawled along on our knees all at once mother crouched down under the grass and i did the same we saw some of those queer beings that we called two legs riding upon big-tailed deer ponies they yelled as they rode toward us mother growled terribly and rushed upon them she caught one but many more came with their dogs and drove us into a thicket they sent the red willows singing after us and two of them stuck in mother's side when we got away at last she tried to pull them out but they hurt her terribly she pulled them both out at last but soon after she lay down and died i stayed in the woods alone for two days then i went around the many wakanchante on the south side and there made my lonely den there i found plenty of hazelnuts acorns and wild plums upon the plains the teepsina were abundant and i saw nothing of my enemies one day i found a footprint not unlike my own i followed it to see who the stranger might be upon the bluffs among the oak groves i discovered a beautiful young female gathering acorns she was of a different band from mine for she wore a jet black dress at first she was disposed to resent my intrusion but when i told her of my lonely life she agreed to share it with me we came back to my home on the south side of the hill there we lived happy for a whole year when the autumn came again Woshepi, for this was her name said that she must make a warm nest for the winter and i was left alone again now said Wayuha, i have come to a part of my story that few people understand all the long winter chotanka slept in his den and with the early spring there came a great thunderstorm he was aroused by a frightful crash that seemed to shake the hills and lo a handsome young man stood at his door he looked but was not afraid for he saw that the stranger carried none of those red willows with feather tips he was unarmed and smiling i come said he with a challenge to run a race whoever wins will be the hero of his kind and the defeated must do as the winner says thereafter this is a rare honor that i have brought you the whole world will see the race the animal world will shout for you and the spirits will cheer me on you are not a coward and therefore you will not refuse my challenge no replied chotanka after a short hesitation the young man was fine-looking but lightly built we shall start from the chante and that will be our goal 
come let us go for the universe is waiting impatiently exclaimed the stranger he passed on in advance and just then an old old wrinkled man came to chotanka's door he leaned forward upon his staff my son he said to him i don't want to make you a coward but this young man is the greatest gambler of the universe he has powerful medicine he gambles for life be careful my brothers and i are the only ones who have ever beaten him but he is safe for if he is killed he can resurrect himself i tell you he is great medicine however i think that i can save you listen he will run behind you all the way until you are within a short distance of the goal then he will pass you by in a flash for his name is zigzag fire lightning here is my medicine so speaking he gave me a rabbit skin and a gum of a certain plant when you come near the goal rub yourself with the gum and throw the rabbit skin between you he cannot pass you and who are you grandfather chotanka inquired i am the medicine turtle the old man replied the gambler is a spirit from heaven and those whom he outruns must shortly die you have heard no doubt that all animals know beforehand when they are to be killed and any man who understands these mysteries may also know when he is to die the race was announced to the world the buffalo elk wolves and all the animals came to look on all the spirits of the air came also to cheer for their comrade in the sky the trumpet was sounded the great medicine drum was struck it was the signal for a start the course was around the miniwakan that means around the earth or the ocean everywhere the multitude cheered as the two sped by the young man kept behind chotanka all the time until they came out once more in sight of the shante then he felt a slight shock and he threw his rabbit skin back the stranger tripped and fell chotanka rubbed himself with the gum and ran on until he reached the goal there was a great shout that echoed over the earth but in the heavens there was muttering and grumbling the referee declared that the winner would live to a good old age and zigzag fire promised to come at his call he was indeed great medicine weyuha concluded but you have not told me how chotanka became a man i said one night a beautiful woman came to him in his sleep she enticed him into her white teepee to see what she had there then she shut the door of the teepee and chotanka could not get out but the woman was kind and petted him so that he loved to stay in the white teepee then it was that he became a human born this is a long story but i think oyeza that you will remember it said weyuha and so i did End of part nine, chapter one. Part nine, chapter two of Indian Boyhood by Charles Eastman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Manitoshas hunting. It was in the winter, in the moon of difficulty, January. We had eaten our venison roast for supper, and the embers were burning brightly. Our teepee was especially cheerful. Unchita sat near the entrance, and my uncle and his wife upon the opposite side, while I with my pets occupied the remaining space. Wabita the dog lay near the fire in a half doze, watching out of the corners of his eyes the tame raccoon, which snuggled back against the walls of the teepee, his shrewd brain doubtless concocting some mischief for the hours of darkness. I had already recited a legend of our people all agreed that i had done well having been generously praised i was eager to earn some more compliments by learning a new one so i begged my uncle to tell me a story musingly he replied i can give you a sioux cree tradition and immediately began 
many winters ago there were six teepees standing on the southern slope of moose mountain in the moon of wild cherries september the men to whom these teepees belonged had been attacked by the sioux while hunting buffalo and nearly all killed two or three who managed to get home to tell their sad story were mortally wounded and died soon afterward there was only one old man and several small boys left to hunt and provide for this unfortunate little band of women and children they lived upon teepsinna wild turnips and berries for many days they were almost famished for meat the old man was too feeble to hunt successfully one day in this desolate camp a young cree maiden for such they were declared that she could no longer sit still and see her people suffer she took down her dead father's second bow and quiver full of arrows and begged her old grandmother to accompany her to lake wanagiska where she knew that moose had oftentimes been found i forgot to tell you that her name was manitosha this manitosha and her old grandmother nawakiwi took each a pony and went far up into the woods on the side of the mountain they pitched their wigwam just out of sight of the lake and hobbled their ponies then the old woman said to manitosha go my granddaughter to the outlet of the wanagiska and see if there are any moose tracks there when i was a young woman i came here with your father's father and we pitched our tent near this spot in the night there came three different moose bring me leaves of the birch and cedar twigs i will make medicine for moose she added manitosha obediently disappeared in the woods it was a grove of birch and willow with two good springs down below was a marshy place nawakiwi had bidden the maiden look for nibbled birch and willow twigs for the moose loves to eat them and to have her arrow ready upon the bowstring i have seen this very place many a time added my uncle and this simple remark gave to the story an air of reality the cree maiden went first to the spring and there found fresh tracks of the animal she sought she gathered some cedar berries and chewed them and rubbed some of them on her garments so that the moose might not scent her the sun was already set and she felt she must return to nawakiwi just then Kaga, the hooting owl gave his doleful night call the girl stopped and listened attentively i thought it was a lover's call she whispered to herself a singular challenge pealed across the lake she recognized the alarm call of the loon and fancied that the bird might have caught a glimpse of her game soon she was within a few paces of the temporary lodge of pine boughs and ferns which the grandmother had constructed the old woman met her on the trail ah my child you have returned none too soon i feared you had ventured too far away for the sioux often come to this place to hunt you must not expose yourself carelessly on the shore as the two women lay down to sleep they could hear the ponies munch the rich grass in an open spot near by through the smoke hole of the pine bough wigwam manitosha gazed up into the starry sky and dreamed of what she would do on the morrow when she should surprise the wily moose her grandmother was already sleeping so noisily that it was enough to scare away the game at last the maiden too lost herself in sleep old nawakiwi awoke early first of all she made a fire and burned cedar and birch so that the moose might not detect the human smell then she quickly prepared a meal of wild turnips and berries and awoke the maiden who was surprised to see that the sun was already up she ran down to the spring and hastily splashed hands full of the cold water in her face then she looked for a moment in its mirror-like surface there was the reflection of two moose by the open shore and beyond them manitosha seemed to see a young man standing in another moment all three had disappeared what is the matter with my eyes i am not fully awake yet and i imagine things ugh it's all in my eyes the maiden repeated to herself 
she hastened back to nawakee the vision was so unexpected and so startling that she could not believe in its truth and she said nothing to the old woman breakfast eaten manitosha threw off her robe and appeared in her scantily cut gown of buckskin with long fringes and moccasins and leggings trimmed with quills of the porcupine her father's bow and quiver were thrown over one shoulder and the knife dangled from her belt in its handsome sheath she ran breathlessly along the shore toward the outlet way off near the island midoza the loon swam with his mate occasionally uttering a cry of joy here and there the playful hogan the trout sprang gracefully out of the water in a shower of falling dew as the maiden hastened along she scared up wadawasi the kingfisher who screamed loudly stop wadawasi stop you will frighten my game at last she had reached the outlet she saw at once the moose had been there during the night they had torn up the ground and broken birch and willow twigs in a most disorderly way ah i exclaimed i wish i had been with manitosha then hush my boy never interrupt a story-teller i took a stick and began to level off the ashes in front of me and to draw a map of the lake the outlet the moose and manitosha away off to one side was the solitary wigwam nawakiwi and the ponies manitosha's heart was beating so loud that she could not hear anything resumed my uncle she took some leaves of the winter green and chewed them to calm herself she did not forget to throw in passing a pinch of pulverized tobacco and paint into the spring for manito the spirit among the twinkling leaves of the birch her eye was caught by a moving form and then another she stood motionless grasping her heavy bow the moose not suspecting any danger walked leisurely toward the spring one was a large female moose the other a yearling as they passed manitosha moving so naturally and looking so harmless she almost forgot to let fly an arrow the mother moose seemed to look in her direction but did not see her they had fairly passed her hiding place when she stepped forth and sent a swift arrow into the side of the larger moose both dashed into the thick woods but it was too late the cree maiden had already loosened her second arrow both fell dead before reaching the shore uncle she must have had a splendid aim for in the woods the many little twigs make an arrow bound off to one side i interrupted in great excitement yes but you must remember she was very near the moose it seems to me then uncle that they must have scented her for you have told me that they possess the keenest nose of any animal i persisted doubtless the wind was blowing the other way but nephew you must let me finish my story overjoyed by her success the maiden hastened back to nawakawi but she was gone the ponies were gone too and the wigwam of branches had been demolished while manitosha stood there frightened and undecided what to do a soft voice came from behind a neighboring thicket manitosha manitosha i am here she at once recognized the voice and found it to be nawakiwi who told a strange story that morning a canoe had crossed the wanagiska carrying two men they were sioux the old grandmother had seen them coming and to deceive them she at once pulled down her temporary wigwam and drove the ponies off toward home then she hid herself in the bushes near by for she knew that manitosha must return there come my granddaughter we must hasten home by another way cried the old woman but the maiden said no let us go first to my two moose that i killed this morning and take some meat with us no no my child the sioux are cruel they have killed many of our people if we stay here they will find us i fear i fear them manitosha at last the brave maid convinced her grandmother and the more easily as she too was hungry for meat 
they went to where the big game lay among the bushes and began to dress the moose i think if i were they i would hide all day i would wait until the sioux had gone then i would go back to my moose i interrupted for the third time i will finish the story first then you may tell us what you would do said my uncle reprovingly the two sioux were father and son they too had come to the lake for moose but as the game usually retreated to the island chatansapa had landed his son kangiska to hunt them on the shore while he returned in his canoe to intercept their flight the young man sped along the sandy beach and soon discovered their tracks he followed them up and found blood on the trail this astonished him cautiously he followed on until he found them both lying dead he examined them and found that in each moose there was a single cree arrow wishing to surprise the hunter if possible kangiska lay hidden in the bushes after a little while the two women returned to the spot they passed him as close as the moose had passed the maiden in the morning he saw at once that the maiden had arrows in her quiver like those that had slain the big moose he lay still kangiska looked upon the beautiful cree maiden and loved her finally he forgot himself and made a slight motion manitosha's quick eye caught the little stir among the bushes but she immediately looked the other way and kangiska believed that she had not seen anything at last her eyes met his and something told both that all was well then the maiden smiled and the young man could not remain still any longer he arose suddenly and the old woman nearly fainted from fright but manitosha said fear not grandmother we are two and he is only one while the two women continued to cut up the meat kangiska made a fire by rubbing cedar chips together and they all ate of the moose meat then the old woman finished her work while the young people sat down upon a log in the shade and told each other all their minds kangiska declared by signs that he would go home with manitosha to the cree camp for he loved her they went home and the young man hunted for the unfortunate cree band during the rest of his life his father waited a long time on the island and afterwards searched the shore but he never saw him again he supposed that those footprints he saw were made by crees who had killed his son is that story true uncle i asked eagerly yes the facts are well known there are some sioux mixed bloods among the crees to this day who are descendants of kangiska end of part nine chapter two part ten chapter one of indian boyhood by charles eastman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Ten: Indian Life and Adventure, Chapter One: Life in the Woods. The month of September recalls to every Indian's mind the season of the fall hunt. I remember one such expedition, which is typical of many. Our party appeared on the northwestern side of Turtle Mountain, for we had been hunting buffaloes all summer in the region of the Mouse River between that mountain and the upper missouri as our cone-shaped teepees rose in clusters along the outskirts of the heavy forest that clothes the sloping side of the mountain the scene below was gratifying to a savage eye the rolling yellow plains were checkered with herds of buffaloes along the banks of the streams that ran down from the mountains were also many elk which usually appear at morning and evening and disappear into the forest during the warmer part of the day deer too were plenty and the brooks were alive with trout here and there the streams were dammed by the industrious beaver in the interior of the forest there were lakes with many islands where moose elk deer and bears were abundant the waterfowl were wont to gather here in great numbers among them the crane the swan the loon and many of the smaller birds the forest also was filled with a great variety of birds here the partridge drummed his loudest 
while the whippoorwill sang with spirit and the hooting owl reigned in the night to me as a boy this wilderness was a paradise it was a land of plenty to be sure we did not have any of the luxuries of civilization but we had every convenience and opportunity and luxury of nature we had also the gift of enjoying our good fortune whatever dangers might lurk about us and the truth is that we lived in blessed ignorance of any life that was better than our own as soon as hunting in the woods began the customs regulating it were established the council teepee no longer existed a hunting bonfire was kindled every morning at daybreak at which each brave must appear and report the man who failed to do this before the party set out on the day's hunt was harassed by ridicule as a rule the hunters started before sunrise and the brave who was announced throughout the camp as the first one to return with a deer on his back was a man to be envied the legend teller old smoky day was chosen herald of the camp and it was he who made the announcements after supper was ended we heard his powerful voice resound among the teepees in the forest he would then name a man to kindle the bonfire the next morning his suit of fringed buckskin set off his splendid physique to advantage scarcely had the men disappeared in the woods each morning than all the boys sallied forth apparently engrossed in their games and sports but in reality competing actively with one another in quickness of observation as the day advanced they all kept the sharpest possible lookout suddenly there would come the shrill Woo -coo -hoo! at the top of a boy's voice announcing the bringing in of a deer immediately all the other boys took up the cry each one bent on getting ahead of the rest now we all saw the brave wakuta fairly bent over by his burden a large deer which he carried on his shoulders his fringed buckskin shirt was besprinkled with blood he threw down the deer at the door of his wife's mother's home according to custom and then walked proudly to his own at the door of his father's teepee he stood for a moment straight as a pine tree and then entered when a bear was brought in a hundred or more of these urchins were wont to make the woods resound with their voices wah 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 the brave white rabbit brings a bear wah 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 all day these sing-song cheers were kept up as the game was brought in at last toward the close of the afternoon all the hunters had returned and happiness and contentment reigned absolute in a fashion which i have never observed among the white people even in the best of circumstances the men were lounging and smoking the women actively engaged in the preparation of the evening meal and the care of the meat the choicest of the game was cooked and offered to the great mystery with all the accompanying ceremonies this we called the medicine feast even the women as they lowered the boiling pot or the fragrant roast of venison ready to serve would first whisper great mystery do thou partake of this venison and still be gracious this was the commonly said grace everything went smoothly with us on this occasion when we first entered the woods nothing was wanting to our old way of living the killing of deer and elk and moose had to be stopped for a time since meat was so abundant that we had no use for them any longer only the hunting for pelts such as those of the bear beaver marten and otter was continued but whenever we lived in blessed abundance our braves were wont to turn their thoughts to other occupations especially the hot-blooded youths whose ambition it was to do something noteworthy at just such moments as this there are always a number of priests in readiness whose vocation it is to see into the future and each of whom consults his particular interpreter of the great mystery this ceremony is called by the white people making medicine to the priests the youthful braves hint their impatience for the war-path soon comes the desired dream or prophecy or vision to favor their departure our young men presently received their sign and for a few days all was hurry and excitement on the appointed morning we heard the songs of the warriors and the wailing of the women by which they bade adieu to each other and the eligible braves headed by an experienced man 
old hotanka or loud-voiced raven set out for the grovant country our older heads to be sure had expressed some disapproval of the undertaking for the country in which we were roaming was not our own and we were likely at any time to be taken to task by its rifle owners the plain truth of the matter was that we were intruders hence the more thoughtful among us preferred to be at home and to achieve what renown they could get by defending their homes and families the young men however were so eager for action and excitement that they must needs go off in search of it from the early morning when these braves left us led by the old war priest loud-voiced raven the anxious mothers sisters and sweethearts counted the days old smoky day would occasionally get up early in the morning and sing a strong heart song for his absent grandson i still seem to hear the hoarse cracked voice of the ancient singer as it resounded among the woods for a long time our roving community enjoyed unbroken peace and we were spared any trouble or disturbance our hunters often brought in a deer or elk or bear for fresh meat the beautiful lakes furnished us with fish and wild fowl for variety their placid waters as the autumn advanced reflected the variegated colors of the changing foliage it is my recollection that we were at this time encamped in the vicinity of the turtle mountain's heart it is to the highest cone-shaped peak that the indians aptly give this appellation our camping ground for two months was within a short distance of the peak and the men made it a point to often send one of their number to the top it was understood between them and the war party that we were to remain near this spot and on their return trip the latter were to give the smoke sign which would answer from the top of the hill one day as we were camping on the shore of a large lake with several islands signs of moose were discovered and the men went off to them on rafts carrying their flintlock guns in anticipation of finding two or three of the animals we little fellows as usual were playing down by the sandy shore when we spied what seemed like the root of a great tree floating towards us but on a closer scrutiny we discovered our error it was the head of a huge moose swimming for his life fortunately for him none of the men had remained at home according to our habit we little urchins disappeared in an instant like young prairie chickens in the long grass i was not more than eight years old yet i tested the strength of my bowstring and adjusted my sharpest and best arrow for immediate service my heart leaped violently as the homely but imposing animal neared the shore i was undecided for a moment whether i should not leave my hiding-place and give a war-whoop as soon as he touched the sand then i thought i would keep still and let him have my boy weapon and the only regret that i had was that he would in all probability take it with him and i should be minus one good arrow still i thought i shall claim to be the smallest boy whose arrow was ever carried away by a moose that was enough i gathered myself into a bunch all ready to spring as the long-legged beast pulled himself dripping out of the water and shook off the drops from his long hair i sprang to my feet i felt some of the water in my face i gave him my sharpest arrow with all the force i could master right among the floating ribs then i uttered my war-whoop the moose did not seem to mind the miniature weapon but he was very much frightened by our shrill yelling he took to his long legs and in a minute was out of sight the leaves had now begun to fall and the heavy frosts made the nights very cold we were forced to realize that the short summer of that region had said adieu still we were gay and light-hearted for we had plenty of provisions and no misfortunes had yet overtaken us in our wanderings over the country for nearly three months one day old smoky day returned from the daily hunt with an alarm he had seen a sign a smoke sign this had not appeared in the quarter that they were anxiously watching it came from the east after a long consultation among the men it was concluded from the nature and duration of the smoke that it proceeded from an accidental fire it was further surmised that the fire was not made by sioux 
since it was out of their country, but by a war party of Ojibways, who were accustomed to use matches when lighting their pipes, and to throw them carelessly away. It was thought that a little time had been spent in an attempt to put it out. The council decreed that a strict lookout should be established in behalf of our party. Every day a scout was appointed to reconnoitre in the direction of the smoke. It was agreed that no gun should be fired for twelve days. All our signals were freshly rehearsed among the men. The women and the old men went so far as to dig little convenient holes around their lodges for defense in case of a sudden attack and yet an ojibwe scout would not have suspected from the ordinary appearance of the camp that the sioux had become aware of their neighborhood scouts were stationed just outside of the village at night they had been so trained as to rival an owl or a cat in their ability to see in the dark the twelve days passed by however without bringing any evidence of the nearness of the supposed ojibwe war party and the lookout established for purposes of protection was abandoned soon after this one morning at dawn we were aroused by the sound of the unwelcome war-whoop although only a child i sprang up and was about to rush out as i had been taught to do but my good grandmother pulled me down and gave me a sign to lay flat on the ground i sharpened my ears and lay still all was quiet in camp but at some little distance from us there was a lively encounter. I could distinctly hear the old herald shouting and yelling in exasperation. Ooh! Ooh! was the signal of distress, and I could almost hear the pulse of my own blood vessels. Closer and closer the struggle came, and still the women appeared to grow more and more calm. At last a tremendous charge by the Sioux put the enemy to flight there was a burst of yelling alas my friend and teacher old smoky day was silent he had been pierced to the heart by an arrow from the ojibways although successful we had lost two of our men smoky day and white crane and this incident although hardly unexpected darkened our peaceful sky the camp was filled with songs of victory mingled with the wailing of the relatives of the slain the mothers of the youths who were absent on the war-path could no longer conceal their anxiety one frosty morning for it was then near the end of october the weird song of a solitary brave was heard in an instant the camp was thrown into indescribable confusion the meaning of this was clear as day to everybody all of our war party were killed save the one whose mournful song announced the fate of his companions the lonely warrior was bald eagle the village was convulsed with grief for in sorrow as in joy every indian shares with all the others the old women stood still wherever they might be and wailed dismally at intervals chanting the praises of the departed warriors the wives went a little way from their teepees and there audibly mourned but the young maidens wandered further away from the camp where no one could witness their grief the old man joined in the crying and singing to all appearances the most unmoved of all were the warriors whose tears must be poured forth in the country of the enemy to embitter their vengeance these sat silently within their lodges and strove to conceal their feelings behind a stoical countenance but they would probably have failed had not the soothing weed come to their relief the first sad shock over then came the change of habiliments in savage usage the outward expression of mourning surpasses that of civilization the indian mourner gives up all his good clothing and contents himself with scanty and miserable garments blankets are cut in two and the hair is cropped short often a devoted mother would scarify her arms or legs a sister or a young wife would cut off all her beautiful hair and disfigure herself by undergoing hardships fathers and brothers blackened their faces and wore only the shabbiest garments 
such was the spectacle that our people presented when the bright autumn was gone and the cold shadow of winter and misfortune had fallen upon us we must suffer said they the great mystery is offended end of part ten chapter one Part Ten, Chapter Two of Indian Boyhood by Charles Eastman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Winter Camp. When I was about twelve years old, we wintered upon the Mouse River, west of Turtle Mountain. It was one of the coldest winters I ever knew, and was so regarded by the old men of the tribe. The summer before, there had been plenty of buffalo upon that side of the Missouri, and our people had made many packs of dried buffalo meat and cached them in different places, so that they could get them in case of need. There were many black-tailed deer and elk along the river, and grizzlies were to be found in the open country. Apparently, there was no danger of starvation, so our people thought to winter there. But it proved to be a hard winter there was a great snowfall and the cold was intense the snow was too deep for hunting and the main body of the buffalo had crossed the missouri where it was too far to go after them but there were some smaller herds of the animals scattered about in our vicinity therefore there was still fresh meat to be had but it was not secured without a great deal of difficulty no ponies could be used the men hunted on snowshoes until after the moon of sore eyes march when after a heavy thaw a crust was formed on the snow which would scarcely hold a man it was then that our people hunted buffalo with dogs an unusual expedient sleds were made of buffalo ribs and hickory saplings the runners bound with rawhide with the hair side down these slipped smoothly over the icy crust only small men rode on the sleds when buffalo were reported by the hunting scouts everybody had his dog team ready all went under orders from the police and approached the herd under cover until they came within charging distance the men had their bows and arrows and a few had guns the huge animals could not run fast in the deep snow they all followed a leader trampling out a narrow path the dogs with their drivers soon caught up with them on each side and the hunters brought many of them down i remember when the party returned late in the night the men came in single file well loaded and each dog following his master with an equally heavy load both men and animals were white with frost we boys had waited impatiently for their arrival as soon as we spied them coming a buffalo hunting whistle was started and every urchin in the village added his voice to the weird sound while the dogs who had been left at home joined with us in the chorus the men wearing their buffalo moccasins with the hair inside and robes of the same came home hungry and exhausted it is often supposed that the dog in the indian camp is a useless member of society but it is not so in the wild life we found him one of the most useful of domestic animals especially in an emergency while at this camp a ludicrous incident occurred that is still told about the campfires of the sioux one day the men were hunting on snowshoes and contrived to get within a short distance of the buffalo before they made the attack it was impossible to run fast but the huge animals were equally unable to get away many were killed just as the herd reached an open plain one of the buffaloes stopped and finally lay down three of the men who were pursuing him shortly came up the animal was severely wounded but not dead i shall crawl up to him from behind and stab him said wamadi we cannot wait here for him to die the others agreed wamadi was not considered especially brave but he took out his knife and held it between his teeth he then approached the buffalo from behind and suddenly jumped astride his back the animal was dreadfully frightened and struggled to his feet wamadi's knife fell to the ground but he held on by the long shaggy hair he had a bad seat for he was upon the buffalo's hump there was no chance to jump off he had to stay on as well as he could hurry hurry shoot shoot 
he screamed as the creature plunged and kicked madly in the deep snow. Wamadi's face looked deathly, they said, but his two friends could not help laughing. He was still calling upon them to shoot, but when the others took aim, he would cry, Don't shoot! Don't shoot! You will kill me! At last the animal fell down with him, but Wamadi's two friends also fell down exhausted with laughter. He was ridiculed as a coward thereafter. It was on this very hunt that the chief Mato was killed by a buffalo. It happened in this way. He had wounded the animal, but not fatally, so he shot two more arrows at him from a distance. Then the buffalo became desperate and charged upon him. In his flight, Mato was tripped by sticking one of his snowshoes into a snowdrift from which he could not extricate himself in time. The bull gored him to death. The creek upon which this happened is now called Mato Creek. A little way from our camp there was a log village of French-Canadian half-breeds, but the two villages did not intermingle. About the moon of difficulty, January, we were initiated into some of the peculiar customs of our neighbors. In the middle of the night there was a firing of guns throughout their village. Some of the people thought they had been attacked and went over to assist them, but to their surprise they were told that this was the celebration of the birth of the new year. Our men were treated to many wakan, or spirit water, and they came home crazy and foolish. They talked loud and sang all the rest of the night. Finally, our head chief ordered his young men to tie these men up and put them in a lodge by themselves. He gave orders to untie them when the evil spirit had gone away. During the next day, all our people were invited to attend the half-breed's dance. I never knew before that a new year begins in midwinter. We had always counted that the year ends when the winter ends, and a new year begins with the new life in the springtime. I was now taken for the first time to a white man's dance in a log house. I thought it was the dizziest thing I ever saw. One man sat in a corner sawing away at a stringed board, and all the while he was stamping the floor with his foot and giving an occasional shout. When he called out, the dancers seemed to move faster. The men danced with women, something that we Indians never do. And when the man in the corner shouted, they would swing the women around. It looked very rude to me, as I stood outside with the other boys and peeped through the chinks in the logs. At one time, a young man and woman, facing each other, danced in the middle of the floor. I thought they would surely wear their moccasins out against the rough boards. But after a few minutes, they were relieved by another couple. Then an old man with long curly hair and a fox-skin cap danced alone in the middle of the room, slapping the floor with his moccasined foot in a lightning fashion that I have never seen equaled. He seemed to be a leader among them. When he had finished, the old man invited our principal chief into the middle of the floor, and after the Indian had given a great whoop, the two drank in company. After this, there was so much drinking and loud talking among the men that it was thought best to send us children back to the camp. It was at this place that we found many sand boulders like a big white man's house. There were holes in them like rooms, and we played in these cave-like holes. One day, in the midst of our game, we found the skeleton of a great bear. Evidently he had been wounded and came there to die, for there were several arrows on the floor of the cave. The most exciting event of this year was the attack that the Gros Vent made upon us, just as we moved our camp upon the tableland back of the river in the spring. We had plenty of meat then, and everybody was happy. The grass was beginning to appear, and the ponies to grow fat. One night there was a war dance. A few of our young men had planned to invade the Grovant country, but it seemed that they, too, had been thinking of us. Everybody was interested in the proposed war party. "'Uncle, are you going, too?' I eagerly asked him. "'No.' he replied with a long sigh it is the worst time of year to go on the war-path 
we shall have plenty of fighting this summer as we are going to trench upon their territory in our hunts he added the night was clear and pleasant the war drum was answered by the howls of coyotes on the opposite side of the mouse river i was in the throng watching the braves who were about to go out in search of glory i wish i were old enough i would surely go with this party i thought my friend tatanka was to go he was several years older than i and a hero in my eyes i watched him as he danced with the rest until nearly midnight then i came back to our teepee and rolled myself in my buffalo robe and was soon lost in sleep suddenly i was aroused by loud war cries woo woo hi 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 woo we do woo we do i jumped upon my feet snatched my bow and arrows and rushed out of the teepee frantically yelling as i went stop stop screamed uncheedah and caught me by my long hair by this time the grove hunt had encircled our camp sending volleys of arrows and bullets into our midst the women were digging ditches in which to put their children my uncle was foremost in the battle the sioux bravely withstood the assault although several of our men had already fallen many of the enemy were killed in the field around our teepees the sioux at last got their ponies and made a counter charge led by oe makasan my uncle they cut the grovant party in two and drove them off my friend tatanka was killed i took one of his eagle feathers thinking i would wear it the first time that i ever went upon the warpath i thought i would give anything for the opportunity to go against the grovant because they killed my friend the war songs the wailing for the dead the howling of the dogs was intolerable to me soon after this we broke up our camp and departed for new scenes End of part ten chapter two part ten chapter three of indian boyhood by charles eastman this librivox recording is in the public domain wild harvests when our people lived in minnesota a good part of their natural subsistence was furnished by the wild rice which grew abundantly in all of that region around the shores and all over some of the innumerable lakes of the land of sky-blue water was this wild cereal found indeed some of the watery fields in those days might be compared in extent and fruitfulness with the fields of wheat on minnesota's magnificent farms to-day the wild rice harvesters came in groups of fifteen to twenty families to a lake depending upon the size of the harvest some of the indians hunted buffalo upon the prairie at this season but there were more who preferred to go to the lakes to gather wild rice fish gather berries and hunt the deer there was an abundance of waterfowls among the grain and really no season of the year was happier than this the camping ground was usually an attractive spot with shade and cool breezes off the water the people while they pitched their teepees upon the heights if possible for the sake of a good outlook actually lived in their canoes upon the placid waters the happiest of all perhaps were the young maidens who were all day long in their canoes in twos or threes and when tired of gathering the wild cereal would sit in the boats doing their needlework these maidens learned to imitate the calls of the different waterfowls as a sort of signal to the members of a group even the old women and the boys adopted signals so that while the population of the village was lost to sight in a thick field of wild rice a meeting could be arranged without calling any one by his or her own name it was a great convenience for those young men who sought opportunity to meet certain maidens for there were many canoe paths through the rice august is the harvest month there were many preliminary feasts of fish ducks and venison and offerings in honor of the water chief so that there might not be any drowning accident during the harvest the preparation consisted of a series of feasts and offerings for many days while women and men were making birch canoes for nearly every member of the family must be provided with one for this occasion 
the blueberry and huckleberry picking also preceded the rice gathering there were social events which enlivened the camp of the harvesters such as maidens feasts dances and a canoe regatta or two in which not only the men were participants but women and young girls as well on the appointed day all the canoes were carried to the shore and placed upon the water with prayer and propitiatory offerings each family took possession of the allotted field and tied all the grain in bundles of convenient size allowing it to stand for a few days then they again entered the lake assigning two persons to each canoe one manipulated the paddle while the foremost one gently drew the heads of each bundle toward him and gave it a few strokes with a light rod this caused the rice to fall into the bottom of the craft the field was traversed in this manner back and forth until finished this was the pleasantest and easiest part of the harvest toil the real work was when they prepared the rice for use first of all it must be made perfectly dry they would spread it upon buffalo robes and mats and sometimes upon layers of coarse swamp grass and dry it in the sun if the time was short they would make a scaffold and spread it upon a certain thickness of the green grass and afterward the rice under this a fire was made taking care that the grass did not catch fire when all the rice is gathered and dried the hulling begins a round hole is dug about two feet deep and the same in diameter then the rice is heated over a fireplace and emptied into the hole while it is hot a young man having washed his feet and put on a new pair of moccasins treads upon it until all is hulled the women then pour it upon a robe and begin to shake it so that the chaff will be separated by the wind some of the rice is browned before being hulled during the hulling time there were prizes offered to the young men who can hull quickest and best there were sometimes from twenty to fifty youths dancing with their feet in these holes pretty moccasins were brought by shy maidens to the youths of their choice asking them to hull rice there were daily entertainments which deserved some such name as hulling bee at any rate we all enjoyed them hugely the girls brought with them plenty of good things to eat when all the rice was preparing for the table the matter of storing it must be determined caches were dug by each family in a concealed spot and carefully lined with dry grass and bark here they left their surplus store for a time of need our people were very ingenious in covering up all traces of the hidden food a common trick was to build a fire on top of the mound as much of the rice as could be carried conveniently was packed in par fleshes or cases made of rawhide and brought back with us to our village after all the wild indians could not be justly termed improvident when their manner of life is taken into consideration they let nothing go to waste and labored incessantly during the summer and fall to lay up provision for the inclement season berries of all kinds were industriously gathered and dried in the sun even the wild cherries were pounded up stones and all made into small cakes and dried for use in soups and for mixing with the pounded jerked meat and fat to form a much prized indian delicacy out on the prairie in july and august the women were wont to dig teep sinna with sharpened sticks and many a bagful was dried and put away this teep sinna is the root of a certain plant growing mostly upon high sandy soil it is starchy but solid with a sweetish taste and is very fattening the fully grown teep sinna is two or three inches long and has a dark brown bark not unlike the bark of a young tree it can be eaten raw or stewed and is always kept in a dried state except when it is first dug there was another root that our people gathered in small quantities it is a wild sweet potato found in bottom land or river beds the primitive housekeeper exerted herself much to secure a variety of appetizing dishes she even robbed the field mouse and the muskrat to accomplish her end the tiny mouse gathers for her winter use several excellent kinds of food among these is a wild bean which equals in flavor any domestic bean that i have ever tasted her storehouse is usually under a peculiar mound which the untrained eye would be unable to distinguish from an ant-hill 
there are many pockets underneath into which she industriously gathers the harvest of the summer she is fortunate if the quick eye of a native woman does not detect her hiding place about the month of september while travelling over the prairie a woman is occasionally observed to halt suddenly and waltz around a suspected mound finally the pressure of her heel causes a place to give way and she settles contentedly down to rob the poor mouse of the fruits of her labour the different kinds of beans are put away in different pockets but it is the umenacha she wants the field mouse loves this savoury vegetable for she always gathers it more than any other there is also some of the white star-like manakaka the root of the wild lily this is a good medicine and good to eat when our people were gathering the wild rice they always watched for another plant that grows in the muddy bottom of lakes and ponds it is a white bulb about the size of an ordinary onion this is stored away by the muskrats in their houses by the waterside and there is often a bushel or more of the pisin chincha to be found within it seemed as if everybody was good to the wild indian at least we thought so then i have referred to the opportunities for courting upon the wild rice fields indian courtship is very peculiar in many respects but when you study their daily life you will see the philosophy of their etiquette of love-making there was no parlor courtship the life was largely out of doors which was very favorable to the young men in a nomadic life where the female members of the family have entire control of domestic affairs the work is divided among them all very often the bringing of the wood and water devolves upon the young maids and the spring or the woods become the battleground of love's warfare the nearest water may be some distance from the camp which is all the better sometimes too there is no wood to be had and in that case one would see the young women scattered all over the prairie gathering buffalo chips for fuel this is the way the red men go about to induce the aboriginal maids to listen to their suit as soon as the youth has returned from the warpath or the chase he puts on his porcupine quill embroidered moccasins and leggings and folds his best robe about him he brushes his long glossy hair with a brush made from the tail of the porcupine perfumes it with scented grass or leaves then arranges it in two plates with an otter skin or some other ornament if he is a warrior he adds an eagle feather or two if he chooses to ride he takes his best pony he jumps upon its bare back simply throwing a part of his robe under him to serve as a saddle and holding the end of a lariat tied about the animal's neck he guides him altogether by the motions of his body these wily ponies seem to enter into the spirit of the occasion and very often capture the eyes of the maid by their graceful movements in perfect obedience to their master the general custom is for the young men to pull their robes over their heads leaving only a slit to look through sometimes the same is done by the maiden especially in public courtship he approaches the girl while she is coming from the spring he takes up his position directly in her path if she is in a hurry or does not care to stop she goes around him but if she is willing to stop and listen she puts down on the ground the vessel of water she is carrying very often at the first meeting the maiden does not know who her lover is he does not introduce himself immediately but waits until a second meeting sometimes she does not see his face at all and then she will try to find out who he is and what he looks like before they meet again if he is not a desirable suitor she will go on with her chaperone and end the affair there there are times when maidens go in twos and then there must be two young men to meet them there is some courtship in the night-time either in the early part of the evening on the outskirts of dances and other public affairs or after everybody is supposed to be asleep this is the secret courtship the youth may pull up the tent pins just back of his sweetheart and speak with her during the night he must be a smart young man to do that undetected for the grandmother her chaperone is usually all ears elopements are common there are many reasons for a girl or a youth to defer their wedding it may be from personal pride of one or both the well-born are married publicly and many things are given away in their honour the maiden may desire to attend a certain number of maidens feasts before marrying 
the youth may be poor or he may wish to achieve another honour before surrendering to a woman sometimes a youth is so infatuated with a maiden that he will follow her to any part of the country even after their respective bands have separated for the season i knew of one such case pata tanka had courted a distant relative of my uncle for a long time there seemed to be some objection to him on the part of the girl's parents although the girl herself was willing the large camp had been broken up for the fall hunt and my uncle's band went one way while the young man's family went in the other direction after three days of travelling we came to a good hunting ground and made camp one evening somebody saw the young man he had been following his sweetheart and sleeping out of doors all that time although the nights were already frosty and cold he met her every day in secret and she brought him food but he would not come near the teepee finally her people yielded and she went back with him to his band when we lived our natural life there was much singing of war songs medicine hunting and love songs sometimes there were few words or none but everything was understood by the inflection from this i have often thought that there must be a language of dumb beasts the crude musical instrument of the sioux the flute was made to appeal to the susceptible ears of the maidens late into the night there comes to me now the picture of two young men with their robes over their heads and only a portion of the handmade and carved chotanka the flute protruding from its folds i can see all the maidens slyly turn their heads to listen now i hear one of the youths begin to sing a plaintive serenade as in days gone by hey yay yay hey yay yay ah hey yay listen you will hear of him maiden you will hear of him listen he will shortly go wasula feels that she must come out but she has no good excuse so she stirs up the embers of the fire and causes an unnecessary smoke in the teepee then she has an excuse to come out and fix up the tent flaps she takes a long time to adjust these pointed ears of the teepee with their long poles for the wind seems to be unsettled finally chotanka ceases to be heard in a moment a young man appears ghost-like at the maiden's side so it is you is it she asks is your grandmother in he inquires what a brave man you are to fear an old woman we are free the country is wide we can go away and come back when the storm is over ho oh, he replies it is not that i fear her or the consequences of an elopement i fear nothing except that we may be separated the girl goes into the lodge for a moment then slips out once more now she exclaims to the wood or the prairie i am yours they disappear in the darkness end of part ten chapter three part ten chapter four of indian boyhood by charles eastman this librivox recording is in the public domain a meeting on the plains we were encamped at one time on the souris or mouse river a tributary of the assiniboine the buffaloes were still plenty hence we were living on the fat of the land one afternoon a scout came in with the announcement that a body of united states troops was approaching this report of course caused much uneasiness among our people a council was held immediately in the course of which the scout was put through a rigid examination before a decision had been reached another scout came in from the field he declared that the moving train reported as a body of troops was in reality a train of canadian carts the two reports differed so widely that it was deemed wise to send out more runners to observe this moving body closely and ascertain definitely its character these soon returned with the positive information that the canadians were at hand for said they there are no bright metals in the moving train to send forth flashes of light 
the separate bodies are short like carts with ponies and not like the long four-wheeled wagon drawn by four or six mules that the soldiers use they are not buffaloes and they cannot be mounted troops with pack mules because the individual bodies are too long for that besides the soldiers usually have their chief with his guards leading the train and the little chiefs are also separated from the main body and ride at one side from these observations it was concluded that we were soon to meet with the bois brules as the french called their mixed bloods presumably from the color of their complexions some say that they are named from the burned forests which as woodcutters they are accustomed to leave behind them two or three hours later at about sunset our ears began to distinguish the peculiar music that always accompanied a moving train of their carts it is like the grunting and squealing of many animals and is due to the fact that the wheels and all other parts of these vehicles are made of wood our dogs gleefully augmented the volume of inharmonious sound they stopped a little way from our camp upon a grassy plain and the ponies were made to wheel their clumsy burdens into a perfect circle the shafts being turned inward thus was formed a sort of barricade quite a usual and necessary precaution in their nomadic and adventurous life within this circle the tents were pitched and many cheerful fires were soon kindled the garcons were hurriedly driving the ponies to water with much cracking of whips and outbursting of impatient oaths our chief and his principal warriors briefly conferred with the strangers and it was understood by both parties that no thought of hostilities lurked in the minds of either after having observed the exchange of presents that always follows a peace council there were friendly and hospitable feasts in both camps the bois brules had been long way from any fort or trading post and it so happened that their inevitable whisky keg was almost empty they had diluted the few gills remaining with several large kettles full of water in order to have any sort of offensive taste it was necessary to add cayenne pepper and a little gentian our men were treated to this concoction and seeing that two or three of the half-breeds pretended to become intoxicated our braves followed their example they made night intolerable with their shouts and singing until past midnight when gradually all disturbance ceased and both camps appeared to be wrapped in deep slumber suddenly the loud report of a gun stirred the sleepers many more reports were heard in quick succession all coming from the camp of the bois brules every man among the sioux sprang to his feet weapon in hand and many ran towards their ponies but there was one significant point about the untimely firing of the guns they were all directed heavenward one of our old men who understood better than any one else the manners of the half-breeds thus proclaimed at the top of his voice let the people sleep this that we have heard is the announcement of a boy's advent into the world it is their custom to introduce with gunpowder a newborn boy again quiet was restored in the neighboring camps and for a time the night reigned undisturbed but scarcely had we fallen into a sound sleep when we were for the second time rudely aroused by the firing of guns and the yelling of warriors this time it was discovered that almost all the ponies including those of our neighbors had been stealthily driven off by horse thieves of another tribe these miscreants were adepts in their profession for they had accomplished their purpose with much skill almost under the very eyes of the foe and had it not been for the invincible superstition of slow dog they would have met with complete success as it was they caused us no little trouble and anxiety but after a hot pursuit of a whole day with the assistance of the half-breeds our horses were recaptured slow dog was one of those indians who are filled with conceit and boasting loudly their pretensions as medicine men without any success only bring upon themselves an unnecessary amount of embarrassment and ridicule yet there is one quality always possessed by such persons among a savage people as elsewhere namely great perseverance and tenacity in their self-assertion 
so the blessing of ignorance kept slow dog always cheerful and he seemed if anything to derive some pleasure from the endless insinuations and ridicule of the people now slow dog had loudly proclaimed on the night before this event that he had received the warning of a bad dream in which he had seen all the ponies belonging to the tribe stampeded and driven westward but who cares for slow dog's dream said everybody none of the really great medicine men have had any such visions therefore our little community given as they were to superstition anticipated no special danger it is true that when the first scout reported the approach of troops some of the people had weakened and said to one another after all perhaps poor slow dog may be right but we are always too ready to laugh at him however this feeling quickly passed away when the jovial canadians arrived and the old man was left alone to brood upon his warning he was faithful to his dream during all the hilarity of the feast and the drinking of the mock whisky he acted as self-constituted sentinel finally when everybody else had succumbed to sleep he gathered together several broken and discarded lariats of various materials leather buffalo's hair and horse's hair having lengthened this variegated rope with innumerable knots he fastened one end of it around the neck of his old war-horse and tied the other to his wrist instead of sleeping inside the tent as usual he rolled himself in a buffalo robe and lay down in its shadow from this place he watched until the moon had disappeared behind the western horizon and just as the gray dawn began to appear in the east his eyes were attracted to what seemed to be a dog moving about the picketed ponies upon a closer scrutiny he saw that its actions were unnatural toka abi do toka abi do the enemy the enemy exclaimed slow dog with a war-whoop he sprang toward the intruder who rose up and leaped upon the back of slow dog's war-steed he had cut the hobble as well as the device of the old medicine man the sioux now bent his bow to shoot but it was too late the other quickly dodged behind the animal and from under its chest he sent a deadly arrow to slow dog's bosom then he remounted the pony and set off at full speed after his comrades who had already started as the sioux braves responded to the alarm and passed by the daring old warrior in pursuit of their enemies who had stampeded most of the loose ponies the old man cried out i brave slow dog who have so often made a path for you on the field of battle am now about to make one to the land of spirits so speaking the old man died the sioux were joined in the chase by the friendly mixed bloods and in the end the blackfeet were compelled to pay dearly for the blood of the poor old man on that beautiful morning all nature seemed brilliant and smiling but the sioux were mourning and wailing for the death of one who had been an object of ridicule during most of his life they appreciated the part that slow dog had played in this last event and his memory was honored by all the tribe End of part ten chapter four part eleven of indian boyhood by charles eastman this librivox recording is in the public domain the laughing philosopher there is scarcely anything so exasperating to me as the idea that the natives of this country have no sense of humor and no faculty for mirth this phase of their character is well understood by those whose fortune or misfortune it has been to live among them day in and day out at their homes i don't believe i ever heard a real hearty laugh away from the indians fireside i have often spent an entire evening in laughing with them until i could laugh no more there are evenings when the recognized wit or story-teller of the village gives a free entertainment which keeps the rest of the community in a convulsive state until he leaves them however indian humor consists as much in the gestures and inflections of the voice as in words and is really untranslatable matogi yellow bear was a natural humorous speaker and a very diffident man at other times 
he usually said little but when he was in the mood he could keep a large company in a roar this was especially the case whenever he met his brother-in-law tamidoka it was a custom with us indians to joke more particularly with our brothers and sisters-in-law but no one ever complained or resented any of these jokes however personal they might be that would be an unpardonable breach of etiquette tamidoka i heard that you tried to capture a buck by holding on to his tail said matogi laughing i believe that feat cannot be performed any more at least it never has been since the pale-face brought us the knife the mysterious iron and the pulverized coal that makes bullets fly since our ancestors hunted with stone knives and hatches i say that has never been done the fact was that tamidoka had stunned a buck that day while hunting and as he was about to dress him the animal got up and attempted to run whereupon the indian launched forth to secure his game he only succeeded in grasping the tail of the deer and was pulled about all over the meadows and the adjacent woods until the tail came off in his hands matagi thought this too good a joke to be lost i sat near the door of the tent and thoroughly enjoyed the story of the comical accident yes tamidoka quietly replied i thought i would do something to beat the story of the man who rode a young elk and yelled frantically for help crying like a woman ah oh, that was only a legend retorted matagi for it was he who was the hero of this tale in his younger days but this is a fresh feat of to-day chank payuha said he could not tell which was the most scared the buck or you he continued he said the deer's eyes were bulging out of their sockets while tammy doka's mouth was constantly enlarging toward his ears and his hair floated on the wind shaking among the branches of the trees that will go down with the traditions of our fathers he concluded with an air of satisfaction it was a singular mishap admitted tamidoka the pipe had been filled by matagi and passed to tamidoka good-naturedly still with a broad smile on his face it must be acknowledged he resumed that you have the strongest kind of a grip for no one else could hold on as long as you did and secure such a trophy besides that tail will do for an eagle feather holder by this time the teepee was packed to overflowing loud laughter had been heard issuing from the lodge of matagi and everybody suspected that he had something good so many had come to listen i think we should hear the whole matter said one of the late comers the teepee was brightly lit by the burning embers and all the men were sitting with their knees up against their chests held in that position by wrapping their robes tightly around loins and knees this fixed them something in the fashion of a rocking chair while well, no one saw him except chank paiuha matagi remarked yes yes he must tell us about it exclaimed a chorus of voices this is what i saw the witness began i was tracking a buck and a doe as i approached a small opening at the creek side boom came a report of the mysterious iron i remained in a stooping position hoping to see a deer cross the opening in this i was not disappointed for immediately after the report a fine buck dashed forth with tamidoka close behind him the latter was holding on to the deer's tail with both hands and his knife was in his mouth but it soon dropped out tamidoka i shouted haven't you got hold of the wrong animal but as i spoke they disappeared into the woods in a minute they both appeared again and then it was that i began to laugh i could not stop it almost killed me the deer jumped the longest jumps i ever saw tommy doka walked the longest paces and was very swift his hair was whipping the trees as they went by water poured down his face 
i stood bent forward because i could not straighten my backbone and was ready to fall when they again disappeared when they came out for the third time it seemed as if the woods and the meadow were moving too tammy doka skipped across the opening as if he were a grasshopper learning to hop i fell down when i came to he was putting water on my face and head but when i looked at him i fell again and did not know anything until the sun had passed the mid sky the company was kept roaring all the way through this account while tommy doka himself heartily joined in the mirth ho 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 they said he has made his name famous in our annals this will be told of him henceforth it reminds me of chadozi's bear story said one his was more thrilling because it was really dangerous interposed another you can tell it to us babdu remarked a third the man thus addressed made no immediate reply he was smoking contentedly at last he silently returned the pipe to matagi with whom it had begun its rounds deliberately he tightened his robe around him saying as he did so oh yes i was with him it was by a very little that he saved his life i will tell you how it happened i was hunting with these two men nagida and chadozi we came to some wild cherry bushes i began to eat of the fruit when i saw a large silver tip crawling towards us look out there is a grizzly here i shouted and i ran my pony out onto the prairie but the others had already dismounted nagida had just time to jump upon his pony and get out of the way but the bear seized hold of his robe and pulled it off chadozi stood upon the verge of a steep bank below which there ran a deep and swift flowing stream the bear rushed upon him so suddenly that when he took a step backward they both fell into the creek together it was a fall of about twice the height of a man did they go out of sight someone inquired yes both fell headlong in his excitement chadozi laid hold of the bear in the water and i never saw a bear try so hard to get away from a man as this one did ha 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 they all laughed when they came to the surface again they were both so eager to get to the shore that each let go and they swam as quickly as they could to opposite sides chadozi could not get any further so he clung to a stray root still keeping a close watch of the bear who was forced to do the same they were both hung regarding each other with looks of contempt and defiance ah ha 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 they all laughed again at last the bear swam along the edge to a lower place and we pulled chadozi up by means of our lariats all this time he had been groaning so loud that we supposed he was badly torn but when i looked for his wounds i found a mere scratch again the chorus of appreciation from his hearers the strangest thing about this affair of mine spoke up tamidoka is that i dreamed the whole thing the night before there are some dreams come true and i am a believer in dreams one remarked yes certainly so are we all you know hacha almost lost his life by believing in dreams commented matugi let us hear that story was the general request you have all heard of hacha the great medicine man who did many wonderful things he once dreamed four nights in succession of flying from a high cliff over the minnesota river he recollected every particular of the scene and it made a great impression upon his mind the next day after he had dreamed it for the fourth time he proposed to his wife that they go down to the river to swim but his real purpose was to see the place of his dream he did find the place and it seemed to hacha exactly like a crooked tree grew out of the top of the cliff and the water below was very deep did he really fly
fly i called impatiently from the doorway where i had been listening and laughing with the rest oh that is what i shall tell you he was swimming about with his wife who is a fine swimmer but all at once hata disappeared presently he stood upon the very tree that he had seen in his dream and gazed out over the water the tree was very springy and hacha felt sure that he could fly so before long he launched bravely forth from the cliff he kicked out vigorously and swung both arms as he did so but nevertheless he came down to the bottom of the water like a crow that had been shot on the wing oh ho 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 oh ho ho and the whole company laughed unreservedly his wife screamed loudly as hacha whirled downward and went out of sight like a blue heron after a fish then she feared he might be stunned so she swam to him and dragged him to the shore he could not speak but the woman overwhelmed him with reproaches what are you trying to do you old idiot do you want to kill yourself she screamed again and again woman be silent he replied and he said nothing more he did not tell his dream for many years afterward not until he was a very old man and about to die did hacha tell any one how he thought he could fly and at this they all laughed louder than ever End of part 11